All right, hello everybody, and welcome to another month of the Hero Lab webinars. Uh, this is something that, oh man, I'm really excited to talk about. I think that if there's anything else that I've spent a lot of nerdy time researching and thinking about and learning about is kind of this concept of workloads. Um, and what I really want to do today is I want to kind of overview um, all of the things that I think are important uh, from the research world and from the gymnastics world of coaches that I've talked to and some of the international experiences that I've had and I'd like to combine that into kind of what you know we can do every day as coaches medical providers as consultants or as people who are working with gymnastics um, to really apply this concept of a workload uh, in gymnastics I think that it's, it's awesome that there's so much incredible research being done in this area and um, I've been really lucky and fortunate to kind of have conversations with some of the authors of the papers that we'll talk about to get their ideas about how this would transfer into gymnastics and uh, I'd like to kind of take all that really great information you know, and, and put it into the everyday world that we deal with because unfortunately there's not a lot of gymnastics specific research that's out there. And uh, when you look at gymnastics versus, you know, baseball or versus running, uh, very, very complicated and intricate sport uh, where there's a lot of different skills, surfaces, age levels, things like that versus, you know, baseball kind of always just has the motion of throwing or things like that that are a little bit easier to think about. So, We'll get started here, and I think, you know, always thinking about, you know, why are we even having this discussion? You know, why is this, uh, you know, concept going to be talked about for a couple months in our in our hero lab? And I think that the biggest reason is that, you know, when you look across, you know, injury uh, prediction research and you look across performance prediction research and things like that, uh, the concept of a workload is by far becoming one of the most important things that all sports are talking about, that are measuring, that are trying to find more information on. So it, it's, it's blowing up really fast in all of the you know, younger youth athletic sports, but also in the collegiate, the professional and the international competition of the Olympic cycles. So I think it's really cool that we have that, but that's kind of where the research is moving towards. So we want to follow those trends. Uh, I think that one of the reasons it's really important to kind of have this conversation is because even though it's important in all sports, it's especially more important to talk about this in young athletes who specialize early, right? So gymnastics and maybe dance and uh, baseball players who are young and throwing more. Um, and when you have young athletes that are, you know, starting from the age of five, six, and seven in our sports and they're specializing very early, uh, it becomes almost uh, mandatory that you have to really understand the concept of a workload and how much is too much and how much is not enough to, you know, prepare somebody for skills and progress them in a healthy manner. So uh, if you're someone who's working in gymnastics, which is probably, you know, why you're reading this um, or why you're watching this webinar is that, it, you know, we really have to be meticulous about understanding these concepts and applying the science that we have. Okay, and the other great thing is that this concept is just is exploding, like I said. So every month we have new papers about new information and things that people learn. And uh, there's a lot of people working in this area, uh, including myself in gymnastics, but other other sports in the U.S. So we can kind of collaborate and learn from each other. And, you know, it's unlike something that comes out, you know, maybe two or three years ago and you don't hear about it in the research for a while. This is constantly evolving and constantly emerging. So there's things that we can kind of take directly from the research articles and apply in practice the next day, which I think is really, really cool. Okay, and like I mentioned, unfortunately, this is not something that's popular or has not been published a ton about uh, in the research for gymnastics. So, you know, where do we start? Do we just kind of say, well, we'll just wait for the research to come out on gymnastics or do we kind of take the best of what we can do? And so what I think we should do is we should try to take the best available information on workloads, right? And we should kind of combine that with what expert coaches say about, you know, training for high level gymnastics or, you know, what gym owners who have had a gym for 20 years say successful from a from an implementation point of view. And what we need to do is kind of understand the best available science but also support that with other research that's just about you know being a human in sports you know there's a lot of really good basic foundational principles we'll talk about that are you know if you're just an athlete who wants to get better if you're just someone who's trying to be healthier there's kind of a way to approach that in a self and uh, safe and healthy manner that's going to be more advantageous than just kind of going for it and going crazy you know and i think i can uh, definitely relate to people uh, that are maybe watching this or have gone through their own fitness journeys as you know take running for example spring comes along like oh it's a nice day maybe i'll go for a run and uh you know what do you do you, you just kind of a very quick little stretch and you're like ah, a couple miles sounds good so you go for a run and you feel great that day and then the next day you wake up and you're like whoa my calves are sore you know everything kind of hurts my knees hurts and you know that's kind of what comes down to this just basic being a human concept is you got to really find that balance of, of doing enough to make it hard but not too much that you have negative consequences and kind of what they call maladaptions in the research so you know the training stimulus was too much 
Okay, so supported by that, supported by the best coaches that we have available from the compulsory and the recreational levels all the way to the, the international elite and uh, some of the collegiate people who have done really, really good things. Um, taking what they believe is good through their years of experience, combining that with what we know about injuries, right? What we know about uh, why people get stress fractures, why people get, um, you know, ACL or uh, Achilles tears in gymnastics, why people have shoulder injuries or wrist injuries in their growth plates. Take that information about how those injuries came about and then combine that uh, with the third component of strength and conditioning research about, you know, what does the, the research say for how do you build somebody up? How do you build their fitness levels? How do you build their capacity so that they can tolerate the, the training workload that we're going to give them? And I want to say really early on in this lecture that um, although injuries are important and although I think that that is a concept we must pay attention to, all the things that we're going to talk about directly cause better performance, right? And so the number one way to really have somebody perform well is to plan their cycles, to plan their training, to really understand pushing them enough to get stronger and get healthier, right? But doing that in a way that's going to ideally peak them for a big performance or is going to is going to peak them for a meet they have on the weekend or peak them for the end of the year, whatever your training goal is, right? Whether that's just to be healthy in gymnastics and enjoy the sport or whether that's really a high level competition uh, down the road, you know, all of the things that we'll talk about not only do they help you you know not get banged up but they also are going to help funnel your your all your work and all your effort into like what you need to be performing for the best so i think that's a really cool concept that i i adopt is that you know this is not only about you know bubble wrapping the athlete and not pushing them too hard it's kind of about finding that ideal dose and we'll talk about that how do we do that Okay, so the first thing we always start with, and you may see this as a common theme through pretty much everything I talk about, is the cultures, the values, and the habits that you have in your gym uh, as a coaching staff, uh, as the athletes themselves, we're teaching them about what their values and habits are, approaching how hard they train and how they take care of their bodies when they're out of the gym and things like that, um, but also just the environment that you create. I think that we're going to talk about some concepts that really um, have opened my eyes and allowed me to study more about the role that a culture and a training environment and kind of not having a toxic environment, how that really helps helps the athlete flourish and helps them go through this ideal adaptation cycle and isn't really just about you know, just beating the athletes up or pushing them just harder, harder, harder. It's about an optimal dose. But if you don't start the conversation here, uh, I promise you all the research that you have on implementing it will be uh, very, very hard to uh, kind of actually see make a difference. So we'll start there, right? But then the bigger things that I think we're really going to talk about is the, the whole concept of a workload ratio and, and this concept of workloads comes down to the ideal work to rest ratio. So is the amount of work that you're doing, is it pushing the athlete enough, right? And then do you have enough of a rest period or a rest interval? to make sure that the athlete gets stronger, you know, runs faster, does, you know, actually things click and they have a technical, you know, correction that finally one day like, oh, aha, I get it. I know how to really lengthen my body for a giant now. Or like, oh, you're actually standing up off the floor, right? That all comes from repeated bouts of small little cycles of pushing the athlete hard enough and then recovering, pushing and then recovering, right? And that comes down to physical, that comes down to the mental, and that also comes down to the emotional. So it all starts with planning. You got to kind of have your your ducks in a row and you got to understand, you know, what are we going to do today? Why are we doing it? You know, how much, you know, are we going to start with five? Are we going to start with three? You know, all these kind of things about like, maybe not saying it's perfect, but you're saying, okay, we have some sort of framework. We're going to, we're going to try to start with this kind of warm up and these, these amount of skills and, and four events here or three events here. And then this kind of strength, just planning in general uh, is going to be really, really important. And that's kind of a theme that we've talked about, especially from the earlier lectures uh, that we've done already. Okay, and then the first part of the equation is just going to be stress, right? You got to you got to do something. You got to you got to push somebody, and I think that's a, an important concept to highlight is that this is not about not doing anything. It's about kind of finding that sweet spot. And I think that the research that I'll cover um, really highlights how this is important, especially in terms of injuries. Usually people think that the only way to not have an injury is not to, to overtrain and not to push them too hard. However, the research is kind of showing that there's a paradox here that um, not preparing somebody and not pushing somebody safely is also uh, indicative of maybe forecasting an injury down the road. So you have to push the kids smart. You know, you have to be intelligent about what you do, but you know, it's okay to, you know, be tired and be sore and, you know, kind of be mentally frustrated. That's, that's that's kind of how gymnastics works. And that's how all sports work. Honestly, that's how just humans work in general. If you never push to the outer threshold of your abilities, then you know you can't expect to see any progress, right? So after we stress somebody, well, then we recover, right? That's the third part of this equation. So we plan what we're doing. We push them appropriately in one practice or one week or one cycle. And then we use that as a recovery period to then allow their body to adapt. And essentially what happens is, you know, you, you push your body and, and, you know, our body is designed to be 
you know, if it's an optimal dose and if it's something that we can handle, the body responds by saying like, okay, well, I realize that that was really hard. I'm sore. I'm tired. I feel like I need to sleep for, you know, the rest of the day. And uh, what your body does as a response is, okay, we don't want that to happen again. We don't want to get beat up by that again. So what we're going to do is instead of just bringing ourselves back to a baseline level, we're actually going to, we're going to lay down some, some new tissue. We're going to, you know, work on strengthening our body. We're going to build some new muscle. We're going to build, you know, we're going to practice the, the, the habits that we know that are going to make us tolerate this the next time. So all that's going to happen is kind of on the inside, right? You're going to have the, your brain and your nervous system kind of adapts to things. The more you learn, right? It strengthens neural pathways, which is kind of like a, a hot topic of neuroplasticity. Uh, your bones grow stronger. Your, your muscles grow stronger. The tendons get stiffer or the tendons get stronger to handle load, right? Those are all the different elements of being able to, to handle a stressor, but also on the mental side of things is that if you got over one little piece of stress, your body knows like, okay, I did last time I was able to handle, you know, these four rope climbs and it was hard, but I did it, you know? So like, okay, next time when four and a half rope climbs come, I'm like, okay, well, I did four last time. I can definitely do five, right? And that happens with routines too. It's like, okay, well, I did a half set last week and I did three of those and I survived pretty well. So, you know, maybe I can do a, a full set just without the dismount and, you know, mentally you can handle that. So plan, stress, recover, right? And I think lastly, the most important thing throughout the research is uh, just tinkering, right? You know, it's not going to be perfect. You're not going to start with a perfect plan. It's not going to all go well. There's going to be things that you have to adjust on the fly. And I think an open communication policy and kind of having transparency is important because, you know, you plan something and you you implement it. And then the next day, maybe, you know, none of the athletes are as sore as you thought. You're like, oh, I thought that was going to be really hard, you know? So, okay, well, that's okay. Next time we'll just push it a little bit more. We'll change the exercises. And it happens on the other side too. There's been plenty of days when I plan something and I think that it's not going to be that bad and then the next day the athletes come back and like oh man my legs are so sore right like I can distinctly remember one one practice where I planned a lot of uh, broad jumps in a uh, in a metabolic conditioning workout or a cardio circuit and I was like oh this won't be that bad maybe like four down and back maybe some handstands and um, I did not think it was going to be that bad but the next day there was like a group text with some of the other kids and they all came and like you should have seen the group text like nobody could walk downstairs like somebody had to butt scoot down and I was like oh man I, I pushed way too hard I didn't even think about I didn't realize and it wasn't malintentioned it was just I didn't really understand or I didn't really predict how much it was going to be and in that circumstance I had another heavy workout plan the next day for something else and I was like oh maybe we'll just take a light day today you know maybe we'll pull back and we'll do tramp and we'll do some drills we'll do some more bars today you know you got to kind of adjust on the fly and I think that's super super important that's where the art and the science of coaching kind of blend together so if you screenshot this and this is kind of your most important thing you take away that this equation you're pretty much every day every you know cycle everything you plan is kind of be built around this framework and it kind of works in a circle so there's never an ending like start and then you finish you're constantly moving around the more you tinker you go back to that planning phase like I just talked about then you go back through stress and recovery you tinker again and you kind of just keep on rolling okay so starting with our cultures our values and our habits right always ask yourself this question every single day when you sit on the weekend and maybe you plan for the week, like what are my values and what are my goals? What am I trying to accomplish on this week with the kids that I work with, with myself, with the gym, with the bigger picture of the region, whatever it is, right? But what are my values and what are my goals? Because that's going to dictate the way that you approach implementing really hard workouts and listening to the kids when they need a recovery and your open reflection uh, you know, ability when you get a tinker, like all of those value level characteristics of gymnastics coaches medical providers parents whoever it is those reflect how you approach each one of those four uh, circles that we just talked about okay then you build that on top of okay now what's the gym's goal right what's the gym's values what do we what do we support as a as a business or as a community or as a tribe of gymnasts right like what is our collective goal that we're trying to do and also if you're having your individual values on point nice like what are our team values like what do we all stand for what's our goal as a, as a team of 20 people who are here working hard and committing you know four hours per day of our life every day to come here and train and do gymnastics okay Based off these two things, you can then say, okay, now I know my goals. We know the team's goals or the values of our gym. How are we going to represent this? How, how do our choices, our habits, and our actions in the gym every day reflect, you know, this, this team goal that we've established or, or reflect, you know, my personal goal of open communication and, and constantly being self-aware? You know, though you can build these things kind of in a layer, and that's going to dictate when you actually prescribe workloads, or when you actually prescribe recovery strategies, you know, how much of it actually gets done and how much of it actually is effective. 
And I'll kind of give you my examples here, right? But first, I just want to review uh, review some of the research that I, I think is just so incredible when it talks about leadership and and you know what type of um, influence uh, a leader has on their on their athletes or on you know a boss has on their their employees. And I think that this research is just so cool to see some of these softer quote unquote softer quote uh, skills reflected into actual data. So number one is that people who have more positive role modeling and have more positive habits, uh, the adherence to exercise for for athletes is higher, so they actually come to practice right the burnout rates are lower in someone who has more of a positive and a more you know open uh lead by example kind of you know uh, I guess mentality, and so we, I call that the say do gap, right? What you say matches what you do, uh, and it's not so much that you're just talking about, you know. Um, I always listen, and I always read, and you know, I I, I want to make sure that you you know are doing the right work to look, uh, work to rest ratio, right? But it's actually saying it and following through with what you what you do, and that influences burnout rates in athletes. Okay, and we'll talk about this study specifically because it's incredible, um, but. The, the positive values and the positive role models and the, and the values that a, a coach or maybe a boss has uh, influences or seems to be correlated to uh, the, the injury rates for overuse and acute injuries, but also the amount of time they miss from practice and competition. So people that had more of an open kind of, um, we're in this together, you know, how can I help you highlights the, the hard work of people and encourages people over more of a, a dictatorship and barking orders. Uh, those athletes under that coach or that um, employer seem to be uh, a little bit less hurt and they seem to want to come to practice more. So I thought that was really, really cool. Um, anxiety levels and practice and competition. So this study looked at uh, football players and it said that, uh, so soccer players, not American football. Uh, it looked at um, that and then there's no one with the handball players that coaches that were more nervous or had more uh, anxiety in a competition setting, uh, their athletes reflected an increase in anxiety levels as well and that caused them to perform uh poorly at their meet or at their competition so very cool saying that if you're that you know that coach who's seeing a score or who is like doesn't have the mat or like kind of is a little like flustered right and you're running around the meet like crazy well that might influence the levels of anxiety that your athletes uh, kind of undertake during their meet and that might cause them to perform worse okay anti-social and social interactions so uh, again that a positive leadership style with more of a, a, a example a lead by example mentality um encouraged more social bonding between teammates um, and then it also helped the athletes become more uh, trustful of their leaders and follow what they say uh, actually adhere to the guidelines that were given in practice uh, and intrinsic motivation is kind of more the the motivation source being I want to do this to get better I want to do this to try to you know enhance my community um, I want to try to be the best version of myself that I can for my goals versus an extrinsic motivation is you know money or fame or social media status or likes and comments and doing it for the approval or the validation of others. So uh, athletes that had more of a positive role model who did that kind of intrinsic based motivation, those athletes actually modeled that uh, much more in their daily training. And then lastly, it just kind of taught the athletes that, you know, if, if I have a coach or an employer, or if I have a, a teacher or a mentor who is, you know, taking uh, solid moral action and they always do the right thing when it's the harder thing to do, um, it allowed the athletes to become more, uh, again, reflective of, you know, I'm doing this because it's hard, but it's worth it. You know, those kind of things of delaying gratification. So, you know, all that research I thought was incredible because it's kind of moving away from the traditional research that you see in workloads, which is more about performance based and injury rates and things like that. And it's talking more about, you know, know the the community the culture the uh you know the positive role modeling that we're trying to accomplish in gymnastics okay so this is just an example of how it applies to me right so this is just for myself you know try to be a good person work real hard and you know i try to make the gym a little bit better every time that i'm there doesn't always happen i have days that i'm super tired and super burnt out you know or just a long season things like that and it's getting better but you know just being a human is a i have days where uh, it doesn't go all as planned and you know the motivation levels aren't you know soaring through the roof and but you try your best every day you try to represent those values of every time i have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with an athlete or you know i walk into the gym and i say hey how are you guys doing like how's everyone feeling you know are you sore from yesterday you know i'm just trying to to constantly think about you know is this contributing to making the gym better and i am i representing the person that i want to be so that when their athletes go through their career they're happy with their experience Hey, from a gym level, right, we have number one at all times is always health first, right? We firmly believe that uh, it's called the priority filter is what we, we kind of use. Uh, the number one priority is always health, okay? The second thing that we all try to do is build really good humans. We try to make kids that are, you know, healthy and are, are developing habits that will last a lifetime, as my good friend Josh Eldridge says, um, and trying to make sure that the person or the, the athlete is going to grow into a, a good, uh, productive, uh, you know, self 
self-motivated individual. And then third is that we try to build great gymnasts, right? So every decision we make, especially when it comes down to strength conditioning, to workloads, to how many routines we make someone do, uh, to you know how hard we're going to push, and how we're going to take a light day, uh, always comes down to health, good humans, then great people. You're sorry, health, great humans, then great people. And if it doesn't follow that order, um, we have to seriously evaluate why we're doing it. Okay, so how do we represent this, right? We say everybody is welcome in our gym. There's there's nobody that is not allowed to come uh, and do gymnastics or train or do rec classes or whatever it is, as long as they're following our culture guidelines, right? As long as they are meeting the behavioral expectations that we set and that's agreed upon by the parents, by the coaching staff, uh, by the um Everybody, anybody who visits our gym, right? Anybody who is here, you're welcome to come. But if your behavior is not in line with what we all agreed upon is our culture guideline, then that's going to be something we're going to talk about. And that's when you may be asked to move, right? But if you're there and you're being a good person, you're working real hard, you're trying to make our gym better, kind of what we talked about with personal values, you know, then you're more than welcome to stay. Whether that means that you want to just do recreational gymnastics and you just want to come once a week and hang out and jump in the foam pit as a as an athlete, cool. That's totally awesome, right? That, that totally works for us all the way to the athletes that are the highest level that say, nope, I want to go through the competitive route and I want to maybe go to college and I want to train real hard six days a week. Uh, you know, everybody's held to the same behavioral standard, whether they're, you know, just starting out in gymnastics and are doing recreational all the way up to the most, you know, high-level athletes that we work with. Okay, number two is their gymnastics career. It's not ours, right? We are not the ones who are doing it. It is up to them to take care of themselves. We're guiding them in their journey, and we're kind of a mentor or a guide who is here to help. They are the ones who are in the driver's seat, though, right? This is number one about them and what they want to do. It is not about us and what we think they should do, right? And we're making decisions based on, you know, not what we want, right, or how we're going to look, but on how they feel and how they feel motivation-wise, Okay, three is we try to, again, from those studies, be a role model, inspect that good person, work real hard mentality. Okay, and then we firmly believe in a radical transparency and open communication policy. You may have heard this in another webinar, but uh, about two years ago, we started saying, okay, everybody is allowed, right, as long as it's in a professional and an appropriate manner, everyone is allowed to voice any complaint at any time directly to our face, right? Whether that needs to happen in a, in a kind of a one-on-one -on -one or a group meeting, right? Because they feel more comfortable there or whether that happens just kind of in practice on the fly, there's nobody who's not allowed to voice their opinion. So um, it happens both ways. You know, I, I think that something really changes when you have a 12-year-old athlete be able to tell you whatever they really think of you. And they've sometimes totally called me out on things that I'm wrong for. I'll say, especially with workload, I'll say, okay, we're going to do, you know, eight sets of 30-second uh, sled pushes uh, and you're going to have a 30-second rest. And it's going to be real hard, right? I'm telling you, it's going to be the most uncomfortable eight minutes you've probably had in a long time, but you're going to get through it. You're going to be okay. And then maybe, you know, 20 minutes later, I say, okay, guys, 10 rounds. We're going to go back and forth 10. And they go, oh, no, you said eight. And I go, oh, yeah, you're right. You know, I did say eight. My fault. I'll change that. I'm not going to make you push. Or at the end of a workout, I say, okay, guys, one more round. Right? And they go, okay, we didn't agree upon that. You know, like you didn't say that beforehand. And it's not me just being a mean coach, being like, no, I just want you to push harder. Right? It's, it's like, oh, no, I live by my word. And that's what I said. But it also goes the other way as if, again, back to those culture guidelines, if somebody is, is not acting in line with what we said is okay in terms of okay you have to be here and you have to work hard back to that stress equation you can't just be gossiping in the corner or chatting about instagram right like if you said we're here to work hard well then we expect you to do that right and it's your behavior that we're critiquing we're not behaving we're not critiquing you as a human but that's the guideline that we spent Okay, so let's start back to this kind of concept of a workload and what we're going with. So number one, you got to plan, right? You got to start with some sort of framework because the basic equation of humans is the proper dose of stress and then the proper dose of recovery ideally equals adaptation, right? If you stress somebody, you have that recovery time and then you give them, you know, a little bit of a window, that's going to allow them to get stronger, faster, heal new tissue, recover, whatever it is, right? But that's planning. That's planning in a nutshell. And the, and the analogy that I really like to use with people in the clinic all the time, but also the girls that I talk to, uh, the girls that I coach is, it's like aspirin, right? Aspirin's really good, right? Aspirin's good for your headache, right? If you have a headache, right? But if you take two aspirin or you take no aspirin, it's not going to help your headache. If you take the whole bottle, it's not going to go well, right? Like two aspirin is really good for your headache. No aspirin won't help you. The whole bottle's probably going to kill you. So it's kind of finding that sweet spot. Like where's that two aspirin analogy that we're trying to do? And the other one that people use a lot is kind of like the Goldilocks and the three bears, right? You know, this porridge is too hot. That's overtraining. This porridge is too cold. You know, that's not pushing you enough, but this porridge is just right. So we're kind of living in that eternal question of, of what's that optimal dose for an athlete. 
pain. I think that you'll see a lot of research from Tim Gabbett. He's one of the he's an Australian researcher, and he's kind of one of the most four uh, formal experts in this uh, area. So I reference a lot of what he's done in his books, and also a couple people uh, across. Uh, the world essentially have a lot of really good concepts to offer. Um, but he, he wrote this chapter in one of the most recent strength conditioning books that I read. And uh, I think that this graph like really illustrates it like almost perfectly, right? And this is taken from a different study, but uh, I think it was like really ideally put um, in his chapter to help put this in a graph representation. So you can see there, we have the load and the recovery where those two arrows are pointing. So if you load somebody, that stoops them down into that kind of reduced uh, ability, right? They're tired, they're fatigued, they're sore, they can't run as fast, their power is not quite there, they're kind of maybe brain fog, they're a lot off in the clouds a little bit, right? But then you apply a recovery, right, which is that next arrow, and that allows them to kind of come up through this curve of back to where they were. And that's kind of what happens with um, humans is that not only do you get to this poor period of baseline, right, you actually called super compensation. So you actually build new tissue, you get stronger, again, you can, you have that mental coping strategy, like, oh, I did four rope climbs last time, I can handle four and a half now, right, you kind of pop up above, and now your new baseline is actually going to be higher than it was before. And then what happens is you apply another load, it drops you back down, but now you don't dip as far, because you have more to work with, maybe in the tank. And this can kind of be seen on a weekly basis, on a daily basis, right, this could be like Monday to Tuesday, right, hopefully this could be like weeks, this could be like a, a three weeks of loading here and like a strength cycle to one week of off this could be months this could be pushing really hard in the summer giving somebody a week off before uh, fall starts for the for the school year and they kind of get that so these things can all be seen across multiple timelines but essentially is that you apply another load it drops down then you recover then boom you pop back up and now over maybe again a week over a month or over an entire year the change from this bottom level to this high level that's essentially what's happening and that can be your physical strength, your your cardio capacity, that can be your mental toughness, that can be technically, maybe you just do all these drills and it doesn't really work and then one day they do a beautiful, you know, layout and you're like, whoa, where did that come from, right? You know, that's probably the process of all these cycles of adaptation that finally get up to that nice high level. So that's what we're looking for. Right, and then on the other side, you can see this kind of as a net positive or a net negative. And this is where that Goldilocks analogy comes back is with this load and recovery, if you blew this back and you kind of looked at a bigger picture, you could see, okay, across maybe uh, six months, you know, what you're doing is you're building up these little peaks and valleys. And then eventually you take that week off for like a, a after the summer, right? And then eventually the year builds and builds and builds and builds and builds. And ideally over the course of an entire competition season or a year, you're getting that huge net positive from bottom to top, right? The opposite of what happens is if you either overload somebody or you don't allow proper recovery through planning, right? What happens is you never return to that higher baseline level and you slowly start to unfortunately drip down, right? So like maybe Maybe you get to here and then you, you drop down and then maybe you get back up close but then you drop down or you know a, a big week of school comes up and then a huge fight with your family comes up and all that kind of trends you downward well that's what happens when you get overtraining right that's overtraining that's kind of that concept of burnout that's kind of that concept of um, you know stalled performance is that people just kind of tank here from a physical mental and emotional point of view because again that that work to rest ratio wasn't ideal right and you never really struck that ideal balance of pushing enough but then allowing recovery so that's where we're going to go for the rest of this lecture. Okay, so how do we do this, right? Well, you always start at the year-long level, and I have a couple friends of mine that are very, very well known in their strength conditioning uh, expertise. They're going to come on and do some webinars more specifically on how to plan, uh, you know, the year, the month, the, the actual days of strength conditioning. But you start with that bigger picture of, okay, what's the What's the entire year look like? And I'll give you an example for gymnastics after. What's the entire year look like? What are we going to do in this training block? Maybe two to three months. What's our main focus for, you know, are we doing skills? Are we doing combinations? Are we doing, you know, general strength work? Are we doing power development, right? Are we doing just general cardio? Are we doing trying to hit for routines in a 90 second floor routine? What's the block look like? Break that down into month by month of maybe four weeks, right? Then you go, okay, now this week, what's our big focus? What events are we doing? Uh, how many days for strength do we have you know what are we going to do for our mock meet competition if we're in the middle of a season or something like that okay and then you come down to the day like okay well today we have bars beam and floor a 30 minute flexibility block and then we have a 30 minute strength block okay what are we going to do in each of those you know chunks what's the assignment going to be and that's last right so on bars today we're going to do a 10 minute warm-up with basics we're going to do 20 minutes of maybe a skill and then we're going to end by showing off those skills in a three-part combination that's going to be our workload for the day right we're going to measure those things in time maybe or we're going to measure those 
those things and the number of repetitions we ask an athlete to do. But you can see how that planning starts from the year block way up at the top left, right? And it trickles down into chunks, right? This is the most important thing you can do as a coach, as a medical provider, or as someone who's consulting with a gym or planning is, is just taking a step back and going from the bird's eye view of like, okay, what's the entire year look like? Where are our meets? Uh, what days of the week are we going to train? What coaches do we have available? All the way down to the, okay, you're going to be on bars with this group of level fours and you're going to work on this skill and then you're going to move to floor, you know, just the actual nitty gritty. So again, we can look at this from more of a gymnastics point of view and say, like, okay, now where do we go from here if we're actually talking about the gym? Well, for our gym, right, we like to, we like to peak at nationals. That's kind of our big goal. We don't have an elite team or calendar, right? Our recreational team has a little bit of a different uh, end goal, like towards their like kind of gym show, we call it, right? But for the competitive athletes that I work with, the goal is to peak at nationals because that's kind of like where you show off your stuff. That's where maybe, uh, you know, you have the most chance to succeed or whatever it is. That's the end of the year, right? Okay, well, then we're going to break that down. Maybe for this this block, say we're, with, I'm filming this in September, so... Uh, right now, we're working on connecting skills together. We're working on power in our strength and conditioning. We're working on more interval-based cardio to prepare for routines in, in a couple weeks. Okay, And then what we're doing is we're doing a three-on, one-off uh, approach. So for three weeks, for the first three weeks of September, we're pushing real hard. Uh, and we are trying to make sure that the kids are, are getting the appropriate amount of stress they need. But then we have one week of what we call a deload where uh, we don't not train, but it's like a little bit more of a flexibility, prehab, um, technique work, choreography. We're still doing skills and training, but we're really pulling back on the strength and conditioning and the amount we load them up so they can hopefully get stronger. Okay, and then we do uh, five days in the gym. We have two days that are really, really heavy, our Mondays uh, and our uh, Saturdays. We have two days that are medium, which is our Wednesday and Thursday, or sorry, our Wednesday and our Friday. And then we have Thursday, which is a light day. So we go in our gym, the way that our schedule is set just because of the, the recreational classes and the staffing is we have Monday, Tuesday is off. We have Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, then Sunday is off. And we plan those days around kind of the, the intensity. Okay, so if we're doing a heavy day, right, maybe that's Monday, maybe we're doing, okay, we're doing uh, a, fi a full warm up, and then we're going to do 45 minutes of bars, 45 minutes of floor, 45 minutes of beam, and then 45 minutes of strength and cardio. That's our practice, and maybe we have a cool down after that, but we're going to plan, like, this is a hard day, we're going to push really, really hard, because tomorrow is Tuesday, you're off, and you're going to be able to recover a little bit. Okay? And then it gets down again to that training assignment we talked about. So you can kind of see that now how it correlates to a gymnastics specific position, but that might change based on the season you're in, uh, based on the athletes you work with, based on your goals in your gym, uh, based on, you know, maybe you have a, a shorter season because you're maybe in a compulsory level. Maybe you don't have a season because you're recreational and you just want the kids to have fun. That still applies kind of based on what they're doing and how many hours they have in the gym. Okay, so moving on from here. Uh, like we said, unfortunately, there's not a ton of research on gymnastics, but there is a lot of really good research in some other sports that has been uh, done. So in baseball, they, they count how many pitches they throw, right? They count, uh, you know, if you're 12 years old, you only are allowed to pitch this amount of throws, uh, you know, before you, you know, get pulled out of the game because we're worried about maybe you're hurting your elbow or your Tommy John ligament. Okay, and then also if somebody does get hurt, they get a return to throwing program. So my boss, I'm really lucky that my mentors, Mike and Lenny, um, have done extensive research in throwing programs and saying like, okay, let's let's coming back from an elbow or shoulder injury, we're going to throw from 60 feet because that's not as much force on your elbow as uh, you know 90 feet is. And we're going to do 10 throws at 60, 10 throws at 70, and then we're going to be done for the day. And then two days later, we'll try 15 throws at 60, 15 throws at 70, and maybe five throws at 90 or something like that. But they dose these things on a return to throwing program. Program. Okay, running in uh, you know football as well. So uh, we're talking uh, international football, which is soccer in America is a uh, mileage logged maybe through a GPS. They have GPS trackers on their athletes and during practice and during competitions, they see how many miles they ran, how fast they ran, uh, idle time versus sprinting time. And they, and they calculate those things based on their workload, right? And they have the exact same thing. If somebody has an injury, maybe they hurt their leg or they hurt their back, you know, when they come back, they slowly dose them based on the, the running mileage they were once doing at their highest level competition. And again, this is important for injury, but this is how you peak somebody for an ideal performance, right? You want to build up someone's capacity to handle a 90 minute soccer game, right? That's going to be the expected requirement they need. You have to build up someone's aerobic capacity and someone's fitness to get there. Gymnastics is the same, right? So say your, your end goal is to go to a 
a big meet and maybe you know you're going to have, you know, you get there and you travel and then you have one touch day or one training day. The next day you have maybe a, a, an individual or a team competition and maybe the last day is event finals, right? Or maybe you have a two-day competition where you have two routines to compete or maybe you have uh, something with a longer week where you're traveling or something like that. You have to prepare somebody for that. And maybe if it's just a single meet, maybe you just have traveling and you're competing on a Sunday and that's really new for you. Usually you, you know, you don't train on Sundays and you don't work out. So maybe the four weeks leading up to that, you guys do all your heavy routines and your hard days on Saturday, right? To mimic maybe doing that. So uh, just trying to compete on the weekend. So just some things to think about in other sports, but in gymnastics, what do we do? Well, here are our options, right? This is what I found uh, to be successful from working with our own athletes and thinking about how many we're counting, but also having the ability to work with some super high level uh, gymnastics coaches and medical providers who, you know, are in other countries trying to do the exact same thing that we're doing here in the States or, you know, who are trying to combine their in, their information with other international providers to find some sort of common monitoring system. And so in women's gymnastics, it might be counting the number of hyperextension or backbending skills, but also how many landings they take, right? For men's gymnastics, it might be counting how many pommel horse circles they do or upper bar skills on parallel bars, uh, how many shoulder intensive skills they do, such as in locates dislocates, jams, uh, ring strength, things like that that are more demanding, okay, also lower body impact. Okay, for trampoline, we might be counting how many bounces they take in a session or how many bounces in a routine, right? We also might be uh, counting their flight time, and this is actually something I just learned about more is uh, Steve Gluckstein was giving a Congress lecture at National Congress, and he was saying how there's actually sensors in the trampoline now that measure how much force goes through the um, the ground in the trampoline, there's, and there's lasers across the trampoline bed that calculate how high somebody goes. And so I thought that was pretty crazy because they use it for judging, but uh, that's actually, you know, probably one of the best systems in place to look at the total work done in a session, right? If you count, you know, how many bounces they take and you also are able to calculate maybe flight time, that kind of gives you a window into how much power they're having to put through the tramp and how much uh, force is going through their lower body. So anybody in the trampoline world, maybe start looking into those things and calculating if you can record those things at home on one tramp bed or two and kind of start rolling that data into, you know, how you do it. So for tumbling, right, for, for you can do the same thing with impacts. You can count the number of impacts that you have on the rod strip or that you have in some sort of uh, practice, right? And you can also break those maybe up into low, medium, or high intensity skills. So, you know, very aggressive double layout, full out might be in the high intensity, but just doing the layouts to warm up might be in that low intensity. Okay. And then rhythmic, you can do them based on the most advanced skills, right? Obviously the, the more aggressive a kick is, the higher a leap is, the more demanding a routine is, right? Those kind of things, those motions that are going to be more uh, demanding on someone's body, you can count those as maybe the, the high intensity or high risk skills, and you can count and limit those or, or track those throughout the week. So just some, some helpful ideas to start with. Okay, some other really, really cool things from the research that I've been applying in the gym and using. Okay, so I think uh, Tim Gabbett was the first one to do this, and he talked about this concept of a U-curve, right? And so this is kind of where we talk about the, the the dispelling the myth that, you know, it's only about not doing too much and that too little is, is also going to be something we want to worry about. Okay, so when you have this U-curve, okay, what we're trying to look at here is on one side of the U-curve, right, down here below, if you don't do anything, you're never going to get stronger. You're never going to get faster. You're never going to be prepared for your competition. And you're probably going to get hurt because you're going to overload your body when you try to compete. Or, you know, I always think about like a marathon runner, someone who doesn't have a really good uh, program over like a year to prepare themselves for the marathon. And they say like, oh, I'm just going to grit my teeth and get through it. You know, most of those people break down when they try to run, you know, close to their highest volume or things like that. Well, gymnastics is no different, right? If you never train on hard surfaces, if you never go through full routines or more routines, if you never uh, do a a mock meet competition where you're rotating with the same time intervals that you would have if you had to get rushed from, you know, doing a, a vault and you got to uh, pop your grips on because you're going to warm up real quick. Like if you don't mimic those competition standards, you're never going to prepare somebody physically, mentally, and emotionally to handle that stressor. So doing nothing is definitely not where we want to be. Okay, on the opposite side, which is a problem many of us unfortunately see in gymnastics across the entire world, is doing too much, right? If you just don't have a plan and you're just going for it every single day, you're not tracking what types of exercises you're doing, how much, you're not tracking and planning your strength programs, and you're just kind of going for it, hoping the athletes survive, that's never going to work, right? Kids are going to break down. They're never going to have that uh, window of adaptation where they get stronger, they recover. It's just not going to go well, okay? What we're really trying to do, and this is what uh, Tim and some of the research has done, is kind of find that sweet spot. So what's that balance between not doing uh, too little but not doing too much that kind of lives somebody in the middle and I'd be lying to you if I said that I have the, the absolute best answer to this 
in gymnastics because it's the research is still evolving and we have no data, right? So some sports have a pretty good idea of where they should live, but we don't. So what we do now is we take, again, the best of what we know, we combine it with experience, we combine it with research and we say, okay, we're going to start with uh, five beam series. I want you to hit five beam series, but we're not going to go over eight. Okay. So I want you to really uh, try to knock down these five. And if, if it, starts to fall apart and you get to eight and none of them are working, we're going to stop. We're going to do a drill. We're going to come back tomorrow. We're going to maybe, you know, approach this later in the week. We're going to have a conversation about technically why it's not going well, right? Rather than just doing more back handsprings and more beam series and having someone's back get super, super sore, or from a performance point of view, just having them be super not confident in their beam series, right? If you miss eight beam series, it's really hard to get up there and do it in your routine. So that's what we're kind of trying to do is find that sweet spot. Okay, and I think that this uh, graph is taken from Tim's uh, study, I think in 2016, which is really, really helpful. It's open access, which means that anybody can uh, follow up on the resources and, and look for this uh, this uh, study. So again, they just found that that sweet spot, right, had a lower injury risk kind of in the middle, but it wasn't doing nothing, right? It was the, uh, the ratio of what they had done across four weeks was in, in such a good kind of slow rhythm that they weren't blowing themselves up kind of here on the right where they were spiking their training volume or they were doing too much overall getting into the danger zone right but they were right in the middle and they also weren't down on this side where you can see it's a curve right like this so they had some more injuries in the people who weren't prepared in their training load right then it kind of dropped off and they had a big spike in people who were doing too much but i think that this helps kind of put it into more of a statistical point of view if you're someone who likes looking at the data points Okay, and I'll kind of summarize this in my little graphic here is when you when you look at the the end goal, right, a moderate amount of uh, fitness and, and, you know, workload is actually protective. And we'll talk about this in, in the next slide. But, you know, how you get there is more important than the actual result, right? Like pushing somebody to high level really, really fast, like especially when they come back from maybe a week or a two week break in the summer, going really hard on the first day and spiking that training volume is going to be a problem, right? So what we're looking for is that we don't want to have this, right? We don't want to have this slow ramp up. Maybe you took a week off or maybe you haven't really done too much in the preseason before your meet season comes and you go, oh my God, we have a meet in three weeks, right? More routines, more strength, more cardio, everything. Push, 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 right? Look at that steep slope. Like you've just jacked up the percentage of training volume, right? And people usually suggest you don't want to bump the volume up or the intensity up more than 15 to 30% in any one given week, right? So if you've been doing two routines or you've been doing maybe, you know, 45 minutes of strength and all of a sudden you say, you know what? We're really falling behind. We got to go hard. We're going to do four routines today on each event. We're going to do an hour of strength and we're going to go double the volume we usually do, right? You've just thrown so much at the athlete that again, think about the marathon runner who didn't train properly and then all of a sudden tries to go for a 20, you know, whatever mile run, right? That's going to be huge and they're going to have this huge you know, up top here. And what's going to happen is they're not going to tolerate that well and they're going to crash, right? You're going to have that workload and then boom, they're going to get destroyed. So you don't want to have somebody here. If you think about globally, well, what you've really done is you've tried to attain, attain that high level of fitness or that high level of volume. And all it's going to do is rebound, right? Because now you overloaded the athlete. They're going to fall into that, what we call maladaptation or a negative response. Okay. So this isn't good, right? And this is because we have a spike in training volume. We don't want to just jack up the intensity. You don't want to crank the dial up on the volume too high, right? What we'd instead rather look for is this, right? You can see how you still get to that same level of fitness, but look how it's trending upward, right? You're constantly moving in this upward direction, right? Through these micro cycles of up and down. So well, maybe you have one uh, one day where you kind of hit that optimal dose. You, you give somebody a light day and recover, and then you have another day where you hit it hard and it drains them down. But then again, you pop back up over two days, right? So now you have these three periods of growth. And again, this can be day, this can be Monday to Wednesday to Thursday, like in our training schedule, or this could be weeks. This could be Pushing really hard during five days in the training week, giving them two days off. Pushing really hard five days a week, two days off, right? And they kind of go, uh, sorry, the, the training week here, two days off. Training week here, two days off, right? Six to one, maybe whatever it works in your gym. But think about that micro cycle popping uh, little by little, gradually over time versus just crushing somebody in one week. But I think that journey concept is really important. So if you do want to get someone to a high level of fitness and you want to prepare them for their skill demands mentally and physically and emotionally, but you don't want to do it in a way that's too drastic. Okay, and this is another thing that's really cool. It's kind of a decay rate is something that they're talking about in the research is uh, the time interval between uh, training bouts. Again, trying to make sure that if you do something really, really hard on Monday, that you're giving a little bit more recovery uh, versus if you did a light day on Monday kind of weeding in, you didn't need as, you don't need as much recovery time in the, in, the, in the window to make them back to baseline, okay? And so weighting is the content that's built off that. So if you have someone low, medium, and heavy, you're gonna weight the heavy days a little bit more drastic than you weight the low days, okay? So if you have someone who's really 
really pushed hard in a heavy day, you're going to need more recovery, right? If you have a light day, you don't need to recover as much. You don't need as much time. You can kind of push harder the next day. And that, again, may refer to the day or the week or the month, right? A really, really heavy training week is going to need two days to recover, right? A really, really light training week, maybe you can get away with it time-wise and you can start hitting the, the gas pedal again earlier than you might have done previously, okay? The biggest thing to take away, kids are not mini adults, right? We're not, they're not just little, uh, you know, growth uh, you know, units that can just tolerate the same thing that we do as, you know, 20 and 30 year old people. We have to remember that unlike uh, the adult human body, the, the child human body is, is pouring so much of their resources into growing, into learning, into building new tissue. It's not only about repairing tissue that you break down from training. It's about the fact that they still have to get taller. They have to be in school all day and they have to be mentally taxed. That requires glucose and energy for their brain to work, right? And that's on top of the already, you know, like reparative phase that you have if you push somebody hard in training, whether that's you know, school, you know, stress or whatever it is. Those are things all kind of rolling together. And I think that there's one more thing that's really, really good to kind of understand based on all the things we've talked about so far is that just because we're gymnasts doesn't mean we can't be general athletes, right? And this is from a lot of research and long-term development is that if you want to be an optimal performer, you want to have good mental health, you want to be emotionally, you know, okay with the way your training is going and, and get in there for the long haul safely, you have to cross train. You have to make sure you're doing a little bit of general athleticism. And this will be another webinar we do about, you know, off season or, or kind of summer season training for athletes and how we can mix in some other ideas ideas about training that aren't going to be gymnastic specific monotony, but they're going to allow you to still progress towards your goals. Okay. And takeaway, this is like maybe the most important thing so far, a moderate amount of workload can enhance performance and is protective against injury. Okay. And people always kind of hear my work and they say like, well, we don't want to do back bends or we don't want to swing too much on pommels because of the wrist. Yes, you do. You want to find the optimal dose that's going to strengthen their, their entire body and tolerate those forces, right? Maybe there's some things that we can do to count their numbers and to maybe prepare them better in physical preparation. But at some point you have to expose somebody to these forces. If you ever expect them to get stronger, right? If you find the optimal dose of back handspring uh, bending that doesn't make their back sore but you know gets them stronger and more confident in their skill that's perfect that's right in the money same thing with pommels if you swing a moderate amount of volume and intensity that they can you know adapt the next day and get back their wrist can maybe get stronger and they can slowly get that tissue to be prepared yes you could do some things in your strength and conditioning program that maybe build up that tissue before you go high volume but this the fact still remains is that you got to swing pommels you have to do back handsprings right and over here you have to do Strength. You have to push the athletes hard if you expect them to tolerate some of these high force skills in gymnastics. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. And just kind of to point out, as we've been going along, you might have seen all these research articles. I'm going to make all of these avail available in the, in the uh, follow-up section. So if people are interested in these studies, feel free to look. Okay, so let's talk about the stress concept, right? So we have uh, physical stress. That's kind of something that we understand a lot, right? We also have mental stress we have kind of the, the the social pressure of kids and, and those kind of things in school or whatever but you also have emotional stress right the coolest thing about stress and this is probably for another lecture is that you know all these things are really treated the same in our body you know our body mobilizes a stress response whether we're doing sled pushes or whether we're standing in front of people at school and having to give a lecture or whether we're in a fight with our parents you know it's all those things kind of make your heart rate faster and they make you you know you breathe heavier, they make you anxious, things like that. And so all that accumulates in what we call total stress. Okay, so you got to remember that the actual training you're doing plus the environment and how much pressure that's putting on the athlete plus, you know, maybe how they're coping emotionally, those things all come together to make this, right? If somebody is completely overloaded with all of these stressors, it's going to blow them up and to be freaked out and always kind of jittery and like they can't handle it, they feel burnt out. So remember that things that we do from a physical, mental, and emotional side are just as important. And I really like this analogy. This is from uh, Jason Lydon, who's going to actually be doing a little bit of a webinar for us too, as well as uh, the human bank account, right? Like I love this analogy is that you have a, a, a total bank account, right? And for uh, kids, this might be sometimes uh, hard to understand if they're in or not in the banking world yet. Uh, but you have, a, you have a check box. You have a, a global savings. You have kind of all these things. And the way you uh, kind of use the money, right, is that you take withdrawals, right? You take the money out and you spend it on stuff. You spend it on, you know, food, you spend it on going out and hanging out with your friends, you spend it on new things, whatever you you need for your house or things like that. And right, all of those uh, withdrawals are quote stressors, right? So you have mental stress, you have emotional stress, and you have physical stress. So over here in the graph, you can see that I kind of have these three blocks, 
you know, chunked out as percentages maybe throughout the course of a day of things that take away from your general reserve, right? And then you have, right, maybe a four-hour practice that, that really just drains you. That's really, really hard, right? Maybe you have a huge test, you know, coming up at the end of the week or you have a meet this weekend that you're you're mentally stressing on about or maybe you have, you know, an argument with somebody on social media or you're unhappy with something like that. And, you know, I'm just trying to think about the reality of working with kids is that these are the things they care about. You know, these are things that matter to them. These are the things that stress them. You know, long practices, you know, a huge test that I'm nervous for that I want to do well at or uh, a big meet on Saturday that I'm worried I'm going to do well at. And then social media, you know, like that's the world we live in. Those things are stressful. Those things produce, again, a stress response and they, they take away from your, your bank account or your capacity or what you have left in the tank, which is why at the end of the day, maybe you go home and you're just like, oh, I can't wait to go to bed, right? You've, you've withdrawn so much from your bank account. So I really like that analogy to kind of summarize some of the higher level concepts and research. Okay, so now we can talk about these two different categories. So you have external stressors, then you have internal stressors, right? So external stressors are the actual prescription of work, right? That's the thing you can measure. That's the, you know, that's the actual five releases, the three ring sequences. That's the, the sled pushes that you do for 30 seconds. That's the two hour studying block. That's the, all of those things that are actually measurable and you can do them by repetition, but you can also do them by the time and the intensity, right? So doing 45 minutes of an intense bar workout or doing 30 minutes of a strength session, something like that, right? And the reason we do this is because you have to be able to measure something, right? You can't measure everything, but you have to have some concept of what you're doing. So an external stressor is again, the thing that you can actually look at. Okay, and this easy to track, you can, again, we're trying to find that two aspirin, uh, two aspirin window. We're trying to find that two aspirin dosage that's going to help somebody get that optimal, optimal stress. Okay, on the other side of things, you have the internal stressors, okay? So this has to deal more with how an athlete copes, right? Their perception of how hard something is. And the reason this is super important is because it doesn't matter any way you look at it, you know, the same stressor is not going to stress two people the same. So again, you think back to that that bank account analogy. Maybe somebody didn't have a test, they didn't have any issues on, you know, their social media, and you know their bar workout is is not that challenging because they're they're really repping to go. Versus the other athlete who's completely drained and has a lot of other things in their personal life going on, you know, they're going to think that that bar routine is maybe really really hard because they don't have as much in the bank account to work with. So these are things that you can track via journaling, right? You know, how do you feel? What's your mood? Are you tired? Do you feel good? Right, your perceived level of soreness, like a zero to 10 rating. So zero is none, 10 is wow, this is awful. Right, you can give somebody a, a marker to say like, how do you feel? And they say, you know, seven, you know, versus another athlete says, oh no, I feel fine, I'm a two, right? That workout wasn't that hard, okay? A wellness survey is something really, really easy too. There's some, some articles and things I can attach that are like a very quick 10 question survey about, you know, how do you feel? You know, you, uh, what's your, your mental stress level? You know, are, are you emotionally feeling like you're, you're kind of tolerating training well, things like that. And I think the most important thing above research, above any article you read is that just having conversations with your athletes and talking to them about, hey, how are you feeling? Like, is your, are you okay? Like, is life okay? Is stress okay? And we try to, we call them micro events in our gym is we try to, during the warm up or when they're kind of starting to roll out and they get like, hey, how are you doing? Things going well? Like, I know you had that big test. Is, is that okay? Are you, are you feeling good about that? You know, how do you feel about the meet this weekend? Are you ready to go? Are there things you're worried about? Like, we kind of have, we try to have these conversations every day with the athletes. And I think that helps more. Okay. If you're really trying to look at something that I think uh, is incredibly interesting. Uh, this study by uh, Jan Ekstrand uh, was in the British Journal of Sports Medicine. And what they did is they looked at 36 teams across 17 countries. And what they found in terms of injury rates is that if you had someone who's more of transformative, so they're open, they, they encourage the athletes. This is a, a team that works together and we're all working towards a common goal. Uh, this is not like a, a dictatorship kind of thing. Right. What we're going to find is that they found they had a, a less correlation to injury, less overuse injuries, and they missed less time from practice in that more transformative community based engagement, you know, or kind of in uh, trying to make sure the athlete feels like they have a voice and control in their training versus that dictatorship style, which is more like, you know, you do this because I say so and like, you know, kind of leading through that fear based intimidation method is that that tended to have more injuries, more time missed from practice, and it had to have more people who are unhappy with their leadership style. So um, this was the first study that I found that was like really looking at like mental and emotional stress correlated to something, uh, you know, practical like injuries. I just thought it was so cool because in gymnastics, I think a lot of us are finding that there is that emergence of, unfortunately, uh, you know, the, the negative results of, a, of an overly dictatorship style. Like there's a difference between structure and expectations and, and behaviors and, you know, barking orders. So uh, kind of just keep that in the back of your mind. If you want to read that study, it's open access. And I, I thought it was phenomenal. Okay, so now going back to the bank account, what's the third uh, step in our thing after we plan and we stress somebody is recovery, right? You want to try to, again, give somebody time, give somebody resources to kind of 
rebuild themselves back up. And I think back to the analogy, what is this? This is uh, deposits, right? This is getting paid and putting money back in the bank. So you have time, you have sleep, you have hydration, you have nutrition, and you have activities that decompress them, right? So like, again, thinking physical, mental, and emotional stress. So maybe we have, uh, after they had that four-hour work, uh, workout, they they went home, they got a good eight hours of sleep, and they, they fueled for performance, right? They had good, high-quality nutrition. They were eating enough of the right thing. They they understand kind of uh, how, do they, how do they feel less sore by getting enough calories and things like that. And I'm not going to claim to be a nutritionist. So I'm not going to go into it more than this. But, you know, having that fuel for performance mindset on the mental side, Maybe they had a movie with their friends. Maybe they were mega stressed out about that test of that, you know, meet. And then after practice on Friday, when they were done with training and they had a couple hours to chill before the meet comes, maybe they just had like a movie night with their friends. Maybe they just hung out and that helped their mental stress levels. Okay. And then lastly, for emotional, maybe they talked about it. Maybe they were like with one of their friends and like, man, I can't believe she said that, or I can't believe this, or someone's being really nasty online and maybe just decompressing with a friend or with a parent or journaling about it by themselves. Maybe that helps result, restore some of their emotional, you know, agility and emotional capacity. Okay, so this is what I think is based on all the research that I've read. There's a lot of really good articles that are up in the top right-hand corner. So time is always going to be the number one thing that's important for recovery, right? Having enough time between the hard workouts that you did. Sleep, right? Eight hours of high-quality sleep is going to be super, super important. Okay, nutrition. Again, I'm not a nutritionist. So I'm not going to tell you that I am, but uh, having someone who can give you the the proper recommendations of, uh, you know, kind of the quality of things that you eat and, and, and eating uh, to fuel yourself throughout the entire day before a practice and after a practice to get that ideal recovery to give your body things it needs to repair tissue. Okay, hydration goes right along with nutrition of water. Okay, outside the gym stress management, making sure you have tools to decompress, like okay, journaling or, or scheduling or getting your assignments in advance. Those things are going to enhance your recovery because you're not going to be constantly worried about them. Okay, dynamic compression are kind of what people see as those Normatec boots or those the skins they wear. Those things are helpful. Okay. Uh, once you stack them on top of the first four, okay, and then you have other things, foam rolling, you know, light stretching, uh, doing some active recovery, right, and then everything else that you see on the market, ice, heat, fancy tools, e-stim kind of stuff, and unfortunately, I think that seven and eight uh, are on people's radar uh, too early before one, two, three, and four, so I put this list in order, hopefully, to kind of drive home the point that the first four are going to be where you're going to get the most return on investment if you're looking to see somebody recovery. Okay, so for time, we've talked about this extensively, but planning, right? This is a, scra a snapshot from the six-week mesocycle that we have at our gym. Okay, you can see that everything's kind of laid out, and uh, we'll have, like I said, a separate lecture on planning and periodization, but you have to really take a big step back and plan out what you're doing. You have to talk with people. You have to use that transparency concept to be like, okay, what are we doing? How much? When's the meat coming up? And those kind of things. Okay, sleep. Uh, the, the best book I think uh, that's out here I'll have is by Matthew Walker, but eight hours of sleep or, or less than six hours is shown to be correlated to uh, problems with memory, uh, problems with coordination and power and endurance. If you think about gymnastics, right? Uh, remembering the skills that you're doing and the proper technique, you know, being coordinated, having good power, uh, being able to survive a four-hour practice or a long, hard week of training. Uh, that's definitely on my list of priorities. So educating athletes on sleep, here's what you can do is try to make them have consistency in their sleep and wake cycles, right? Even on the weekends, right? If you have a meet that's coming up and you have to wake up at 8 a.m., right? You should try to wake up around 8 a.m. the weekends before to mimic what it's going to feel like. Okay, limiting caffeine in the afternoon, hopefully not alcohol for most athletes that we work with, uh, but maybe for coaches, for people that are listening, and for you know gym owners, that's for yourself. Uh, but limiting caffeine and alcohol has been uh, more helpful to sleep of a high quality eight hours. Okay, try to get a little bit of a cooler room, right? If you can, maybe a fan or something like that to blow wind on you so you're not sweating like crazy. Uh, and trying to get make sure that before you go to sleep, that 30 to minute 60 window does not have any um, very high intensity uh, blue light. So iPads, iPhones, uh, computers is a very interesting story story of one of our level nines who uh, was doing everything right and she was trying her best, best to recover but she always felt drained at the end of the week and she didn't perform well at her meets and uh, through some technology that we had we monitored her and we found that because she was using her laptop late at night to write papers, uh, she was not falling asleep well for the first couple hours, and she kind of got only six hours of recovery versus eight. So she switched it around, and she started doing uh, her book work last and her computer work first when she came home from school. She would do from you know 9.30 to 10. She would try to do all of her computer work, and then she would end with book work so it wouldn't be blue light in her eyes, and that helped her a ton. Uh, but Matthew Walker's Why We Sleep is one of the most phenomenal books I've read on this topic, so I, I highly encourage people to check it out. He does a really good job of reviewing it literature and giving it in practical dosage. Okay, nutrition. Just going to flat out say this, right? Giving out nutritional advice, diet changes, calories, body image without being uh, honestly a, a registered dietitian or being a, a doctor who specializes in female or male uh, youth athlete uh, 
you know, nutrition is, is just not okay, right? And just plain and simple. It's, it's morally wrong and it's extremely dangerous. And um, I consider myself much more educated on this topic than the average person because I did two years of sports residency work with athletes and, and nutrition stuff. And I still don't even give out this information because I don't think I'm qualified. Uh, I think it's such a slippery slope that if you don't really know the ins and outs of mental health and emotional health and how to deal with this with the young male and female athletes that you can really get into t- uh, dangerous territory. So always refer that out. I always tell athletes, uh, fuel for performance. Josh Eldridge is a phenomenal um, reference or someone you can look at for this. And Jamie Shear, who's actually going to be doing another webinar as well. She's amazing too. And she's helped me a lot kind of have better communication and how to suggest this with athletes. But you got to have that conversation very early with those athletes that, you know, are maybe expressing some issues, but also with the providers who they can get connected to and help. Okay. Hydration. You want to try to aim for that six to eight bottles of uh, water per day, just sipping. Uh, Again, that varies massively based on the athlete, their ability and their goals. So I always refer to nutritionists to kind of be the person who's really dialing this in. Okay, so lastly, step four, what are we going to do here to really think about workloads, right? So we've we've stressed the athlete, we've planned, we've, we've implemented a, a, an appropriate dose of stress, we've given them time to recover and uh, have, have kind of had that conversation about the work to rest ratio, of course, maybe like a day or a week or a month. Right now, what you got to do is just have an honest conversation and be like, hey, we tried some stuff, we hope that it got work, but it's not going to all go perfect, right? There's no way it's going to work out, right? You're the only person that knows your athletes, right? Me being here and saying that you want to do these workloads and you want to talk to your athletes and try this amount or whatever. Like, yes, it's good to hear it from me, maybe from the researcher to, to have other ideas from the research, but they don't know your athletes. They don't know the nuances that it is the art of coaching, the beauty that you have of being with the athlete every single day and, and kind of knowing uh, their natural response. Like if somebody lands and they're wincing in pain or like someone's always just not even on this planet, they're spacing out and they can't get their assignments done. Like you have to be the person who steps and says, Hey, you're not really, you know, you're not really acting like yourself or, or is everything okay? Are you, are you too tired? Are we, are we not maybe like sleeping enough? Do you have something big stressful going on? Like you have to open that door and that conversation, whether you're a medical provider, a parent, whether you are a, you know, a coach who's here, like whatever it is, you're the person who's going to understand them the best. Okay, so what we do personally is that, again, we have those micro events where like when they're foam rolling and it's kind of casual, it's like, hey, how one's feeling? Like, uh, uh, again, I kind of do workouts with my athletes sometimes and I do the strength, so I'll, I'll try to open the conversation and make it not weird. Being like, guys, I'm so sore. My legs hurt so bad. Like, how are you guys doing? And they'll be like, oh my God, me too. Yeah. But right, you can have that conversation with the athletes kind of in a in a micro event when they're just warming up or maybe line them all up. We say, okay, guys, like, hey, how, good to see you. How you doing? Like, hope everyone's having a great day. Uh, you know, it's Thursday and I know people are typically pretty beautiful up like how are we feeling like everyone good are we not good like are your legs sore you know is everyone tired you know and kind of just having this open dialogue about like hey how do you feel tell me kind of what's going on like I can't get inside your head um is anybody kind of like feeling like it's too much is anybody like you know we need to maybe push a little harder because they're really nervous about the meet in two weeks and they don't feel prepared enough you know having that communication line is so so important but if you make it part of your daily lineup and it's part of your culture on a on a on an open transparency basis at all times, but also kind of everybody feels like at the warm up they can kind of voice their opinion of what they feel, good or bad. It doesn't become weird when like all of a sudden like everybody's sore and like all of a sudden you ask like, oh guys, is everybody sore? Like I'm worried. I'm I'm really kind of scared that we're pushing too hard. Or you know, all of a sudden you get to that again that preseason point where like guys, I, I'm really worried that nobody's nobody's really hitting their routines and we haven't pushed enough. Like we got to go really hard. Like it doesn't make it weird to talk about it. It, it kind of becomes part of what you do every day. Hey, you tinker as you need. You know, like I said, back to that broad jump example that day that I unfortunately pushed way too much and I didn't realize the volume was going to be that intense. Nobody could walk the next day, right? I'm not going to go back and I'm not going to do floor routines that day. I'm not going to have people vault on hard that day. I'm not going to have people do dismounts to hard that day, right? That was the, the trampoline pit day, kind of like, okay, let's do our, our dismounts to the pit today on bars instead of actually landing. Let's go to tumble track. Let's do more flexibility. Let's do some prehab, some choreography, right? Trying to just playing on the fly and having that bigger picture plan that you've set back and you've done, but also realizing like this is not going to be perfect every day and I was I was traveling I think in Canada and one of the coaches put it perfectly he was like it's like the weather you know you you plan for you know what you think the weather's going to be and like you bring your umbrella but sometimes it doesn't rain right sometimes the, the sun peaks out and it, it's not as bad as you think and I, I thought that was a really good analogy to be like, yeah, it's just totally like that. Like you want to kind of have a big eye. You want to look at the news and realize if you're going to need a raincoat and pants. But, you know, it doesn't always rain. It's not the end of the world. And you kind of you adjust. Maybe you, you can change your plans. So kind of think about that in the back of your mind. It's a good analogy. Okay, the other analogy I really like is the gas pedal, brake pedal, right? So uh, when you're driving, right, there's sometimes that you always are kind of on the highway and you're in cruise control and the gas is kind of at a steady rate constantly. But somebody cuts into your lane and you got to kind of stomp on the gas real quick, right? It's not like you're, you're always kind of, 
just blindly driving at one speed, you have to always be present, self-aware. You have to be reflecting. You have to be like, okay, like, oh, somebody popped in my lane. Like, mm, slow down real quick. And then it kind of safety passes and you speed back up or whatever it is. But having that self-awareness and kind of thinking about that analogy is all the times when you're you're kind of on the gas and brake together, you're transitioning gears. So you got to have, have that in your, in your point of view is like, you know, some days you're going to be, you know, just cruising along day to day and the gas pedal is appropriate. But then there's other times when, again, somebody says like, you know, I'm really, really tired. I'm exhausted. I, I don't have time for school. You got to kind of hit that brake. I was like, you know, okay, uh, how about we do this? How about you, you do your first event and you do your assignment and then uh, you do the strength maybe uh, tomorrow, right? But you go home early tonight and you get all your homework done. And again, that comes back to our concept of health and great people is that we always believe that uh, the school and education and the long-term kind of uh, aspects of their career are going to be what takes them on far. So we say, okay, well, if you need to come maybe an hour late tomorrow to, to get that paper done or to, to study for your test so you feel a little bit better, I'd rather have you here for three quality hours than five crappy hours. You know, I'd rather have you be here for, you know, do a quick warm up, do your routines, uh, get your strength done and then go home early so you can uh, do your homework, get a good meal and then go to sleep and then come back maybe tomorrow in two days, you know, in a much better state, not as stressed out, not as worried. A always opening uh, conversation with the staff and the parents is always going to be important for this tinkering too. Is sometimes you know you got to remember that parents spend uh, a full 24 hours with the kids, and we maybe only get three to four hours. So they sometimes see things that we don't. And you know, that's an athlete I can think about that we thought things were going well, and she was just like the normal amount of stress. But her mom was like, "Man, I wish you could see her at home. She's she's constantly talking about the skill she's worried about. She's always worried about the meet. She's like, you know, almost pulling her hair out with how stressed out she is between school and this." And we we're like, "Whoa, we had no idea. She never said anything." And um, that allowed us to kind of be like, "Hey, are you are you?" worried about something she's like yeah actually i'm i'm really having a tough time like you know it kind of opened this really good dialogue but it was only because you know i, I allowed you know, an open conversation and, and one of the other coaches uh, actually had it through email is that, that the mom brought up the concern and you know i think as a younger coach i i kind of tried to wall myself off from the parents and say like oh just let me like leave me alone let me coach and like i don't want to talk to you but you know they they have a very valid concern point of view and you know you got to take it with face value but Everybody has an equal voice sometimes in terms of their boundaries and things like that, but you have to understand that they see things that we don't, and they obviously raise the athlete, so they, they, they see a different point of view that we don't sometimes. Okay, so here's some takeaways kind of like that we're going to wrap up with. So I think that using binders to write, plan, track, strength, and cardio is probably the best thing we've ever done. It also has a journal and some tracking sheets that'll be the next webinar we talk about is monitoring and tracking of how we apply some of these things beyond just the practical level that we've talked about now. Okay, and have a, some sort of massive staff meeting every year to really talk about uh, what went well, what didn't go well, what should we change. Uh, again, a global tinkering. And I think that uh, something cool that we've done in our gym is that every time we have a pack of graduating seniors, we uh, we get it all together at the gym and we buy them coffee and breakfast and whatever and say, hey guys, I know you're graduating. Uh, you know, We're trying to fix things for the summer. Is there any feedback that you guys have for us? Good, bad, not great. And I do this with the, with the athletes as well at the end of the year. I say, guys, end of the season, uh, open, open conversation, like what can we do better uh, along with those daily events. But having those graduating seniors kind of tell you about their macro experience throughout the entire year is really, really cool because they can tell you things that you never even thought about. So kind of have that with your staff meeting, have that with your athletes and say, what can we do better? Okay, try to use the coaching uh, plan time to make sure you're, you're tracking things on a day-to-day -day basis, right? So like making sure coaches have the tools, the resources, and the time built into their schedule. If you're a manager here, if you're a coach yourself, you know, building in a half hour before practice. If practice starts at 5.30, I try to get there at 5 every day so I can look at the schedule. I can write down my plans. I can get a whiteboard out and say like, okay, this is what we're doing. I can talk to other coaches, say like, hey, what skills do you want to work on? Like, is there a certain station that you want to work to spa or like things like that? So having those on a day-to-day -day thing really helps get your head kind of in a straight line. Okay, never, ever, ever be too rigid, right? Being too rigid about it and not listening to what your athlete is telling you is the worst mistake you can ever make. Okay, so where do we go now? So like kind of taking this information, you might be like, whoa, my head's kind of swimming. Uh, I don't really know what to do here. So here's what I think you should do along with what we just talked about is so setting caps on the highest risk skills, is, sorry, skills, I should say, not skills. Skills is probably most important, right? So again, the number of hyperextensions and impacts, uh, the impacts for the wrist and shoulders for males. Okay, rotating the daily event focus has also been really, really helpful. So say, for example, for backbending skills, if we're vaulting doing your chenkos, if we're doing uh, backbending type releases or, or a lot of giants one day and we're also doing beam series, well, on floor, we might tum might not tumble super hard into hyperextensions. We might just do dance instead or choreography or some extra work there. Okay, if we're doing very hard dismounts on or very hard landings on vault, we're also doing 
maybe dismounts on parallel bars and maybe they have a really, really heavy impact on a lot of their, uh, you know, skills for a, a male split. Uh, maybe we do in bars and long hangs on high bar. We don't do, again, like huge Chinese taps with dismount on hard surfaces because maybe that volume of landings might just be really, really heavy for them. So things to kind of think about throughout the week. Okay, planning and rotating medium, heavy, and light days. Uh, that's going to be really, really important. Uh, trying to make sure you're having that con that concept of periodization we'll talk about in another webinar. Trying to make sure that happens across all three domains, right? So like your skill volume, your strength volume, your cardio volume, those things are all, again, think about that global stress bucket. Those three things all go into the, the circle of physical stress along with the other two. Okay, trying to have that culture that's open about tracking, monitoring, and transparency, which is, again, going to be the webinar we talk about next, kind of building off this. Okay, and then just being an absolute scientist when it comes down to planning, trying to really plan the year all the way down through the individual assignments and the actual drills you do. Okay, so if you're looking for more research and more uh, information on these topics, I think that there's a lot of really good articles I'll show, but these books were just so incredibly helpful. Uh, Tim Gabbett has a really good chapter on workloads in the, uh, the Turner and Comfort book on the left. From more the recovery side of things, the... Uh, the book by uh, Kelman and Beckman was really, really helpful to kind of understand all the current concepts about recovery. And then the monitoring book on the right has a lot of really good chapters too on the just the global stress cycle and workload periodization. So those three books, I'll, I'll include the links in the, um, the references section after this one, but those are really, really good. Okay, and then just six articles that, uh, again, just really made me stop and think about the way that I was doing things as a medical provider, as a, as a coach, uh, kind of back in the day. So we have a couple international Olympic Committee consensus statements on uh, sport risk and uh, in, in injury. So they just kind of looked at all the different data. Uh, I think this is in 2016, and there's a lot of phenomenal authors on those papers that are really kind of uh, experts in these areas. Uh, those papers by Tim Gabbett, kind of on the left here. So this was that paradox paper that talked about, you know, maybe too much is, is also a problem, but too little is also a problem. We have to find that optimal dose and why pushing kids appropriately is really, really good. It's not always about not training. And then kind of down here, just different models they use to kind of uh, put workloads together and, and what they're looking at now in terms of factors that are the most important. Um, this is a, a paper that kind of just reviews the way you can look at the data and kind of understand what's valuable. And then lastly, this paper is uh, really cool. It's just about like long-term athletic development in athletes from, you know, an Olympic point of view, uh, sorry, an Olympic committee point of view about like how do you help young kids develop over multiple years regardless of whether they're trying to go, you know, to the elite level, but whether they're just trying to have fun in sports and survive and just develop the values that uh, you know sports like gymnastics can teach or whether they do have a long-term competition plan so these are the references again I'll include these in the uh, teachable uh, webinar workshop but you can kind of see all these things that I think are really really cool some of them are extremely extremely nerdy some of them are not uh, but whatever you want to use and then as always we're gonna have a little discussion about this in the uh, the Facebook group. So if you have a, a question about this, you want to, you know, maybe post it in the group after your reading or during the reading of the lectures, uh, or if you want to email me or message me directly, that's totally cool. Um, and I just thank you guys for your time. And I, I really hope that you enjoy this lecture. It's, it's definitely something that's going to become the gold standard in the next three or four years in gymnastics. So I'm, hopefully we can get ahead of it uh, before it becomes something that we all really will get blindsided by. So thank you so much for being here and I appreciate it.